Hey, Intro to IR class. So we have made it. This is the final lecture of the semester. This is uh, Intro to IR 5.3 about the global environment. But first, clearly, I'm in some type of get up, right? These are my Harry Potter robes, my PhD robes. Um, I'm assuming because this is an intro class that none of you are seniors, but you can never be too sure. Maybe this is something that you're throwing in in the last second here. Um, so just in case there are some seniors in this class, I wanted to put this on. I, I can't imagine, guys. I can't imagine what it must feel like to get all the way through here and feel like the last thing to do was to do your graduation ceremony and then not be able to do it. Um, it's really tough. So I've got, I've got pomp and circumstance. Here we go. Can you hear it? Okay. And I've got my robes. I've got no diploma to hold for you, uh, give you, but I do have confetti. Ready? Woo! So congrats to any of you that if you're getting your AA, if you're getting your BA, um, congrats to you. I wish the circumstances could be a little different here um, and that you could walk, but obviously that's not going to happen this semester. Um, but great job. For any of you, you made it. Great job very proud of you right uh the sky is the limit the world is your oyster the future is yours grab life by the no i shouldn't say that one right okay so intro to ir 5.3 the global environment this is the last lecture that we're going to do um we're going to start here with our very last tier right our very last where in the world so here's the photos. Where in the world am I talking about? Okay. If you read the book, you should know already because uh, the reading for today, it was the first intro example that they gave. This is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Okay. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So I've linked down below here a video and it's also, you can see it on the module page. I've linked it down below here on YouTube video number one and it just gives you an interesting overview about the garbage patch and the size of it right and the the challenge the challenge facing the world in terms of how we handle not only this garbage patch but the fact that there are many all over our oceans okay even when we say the great pacific garbage patch there are actually two major garbage patches that are in the oceans floating right now so i should say with the, just the great pacific one the book has a great map 12-2 it has a great thing here looking at um, uh, just kind of a great infographic that goes into a lot of different details about what's going on the size of it what are some of the challenges what are the what is contained within this garbage patch so the big thing you should understand is it's not like some literal like floating uh, landfill or something the plastics that are in this garbage patch are what we call microplastics. So yes, you do have things, uh, big, very large pieces of plastic material that do float at the top, kind of like icebergs. But then what happens due to the sun and due to the rain and waves is micro pieces of that. They're often, um, I think there's a picture in the video, right? It just looks like a pearl that's like the, t the at the tip of your finger. So it's these micro microplastics that break away and those are what create this patch. And it's not just that they're floating at the top, it can actually be going all the way down to the seabed, okay? But the, the Pacific patch alone is three times the size of France, okay, this patch. And so if you imagine some of the issues, not only with navigation uh, challenges, environmental challenges, pollution challenges, and just the challenge of how do we actually address it and attempt to clean not just this one, but any of these patches that are around the world, um, there are lots of challenges at play as to how do we address this, how do we move forward. And we're going to address not only this, the Great Pacific Garbage um, Patch, but other issues that share the same challenge of this patch and why the global environment becomes this sticky issue for us to deal with, whether it's at, right, because we keep doing this micro up to macro level, the state level, the IO level, the NGO level, okay. I, I made it seem like NGOs are bigger than IOs. State level, IO, NGO level, okay. So let's start here with an overview of environmental issues in IR. So 
two classic concerns came to the forefront within IR when it comes to the environment. And these really came out of the industrial era. And so the two issues were number one, conservation of natural resources, realizing that resources are scarce. We will run out. There will be a point in time which we dig all the coal that is in the ground out. We will suck all of the oil that is in a seabed out. What happens when we get to that point, okay? So conservation of natural resources was something that was coming out of the industrial era. We gotta slow our roll a bit to conserve these resources if we want them to last, not only for ourselves, but for future generations. The second one that came out then was damage caused by pollution. So realizing the devastating toll that in particular industrialization took on things like soil and water and air, okay? So by 1972, right, uh, ask the UN, there's a convention for that. There's a convention for everything with the UN. The UN Convention on the Human Environment. So this really solidified the dominance of what we now understand to be the sustainable development agenda. So we've talked about this a lot, not only in the economy section, economic security, we talked about this when it comes to international development. We talked about it again in the past two lectures with human security this emphasis on sustainable development, combating poverty, combating human rights violations in the form of not caring for women and children in the way they need to be cared for, denying them education, denying them health care, these types of issues. Sustainable development then from the environment perspective comes in with these issues of saying there's only so many resources we have to protect them. We have to protect our environment from the harms we are causing it like pollution. If we pollute our water, we need water to drink. We are hurting ourselves, okay? So that's why this fits within a human security lecture to talk about environment and environmental security is because if we don't care for the environment, we're not caring for ourselves because we rely on the environment to survive, okay? So the interesting thing to note here from the IR perspective again, in terms of international environmental politics it mirrors, it reflects what we call in public policy, we call the issue attention cycle. So the issue attention cycle is, we don't know there's a problem until there's a problem. And the minute we know there's a problem, we will throw everything we have at addressing that problem. And a lot of times we can fix it. And then it's fixed and then we move on. And so we'll do something else. We'll do something totally new that creates a new problem. So issue attention cycle is just this cycle that it goes around and round and round like a wheel and I don't know until I know and once I know I fix it and then I keep going and I fix the next problem okay so that's how the environment has worked or environmental law and our interest in environmental security that's largely how it has worked so if you think of something like the o the hole in the ozone right that came to the forefront of scientists saying hey there's a hole up there and people saying, oh my God, you have my attention, how do we fix this? So there was massive movements to rethink everything from the way we design hairsprays, coolant for refrigerators, anything that had chlorofluorocarbons, right, aerosols, re rethinking and redesigning those products so as to limit the impact of making this hole larger. We not only stopped the growth of that hole, but we actually shrunk it, right? We were fixing it through the issue, the, through the attention we put on this issue. So a lot of other things have happened that kind of mirror that, um, but I, I'm not gonna keep giving a, you know, a million examples, but that is one example of this issue attention cycle playing out in real time. So the core, the core of the challenge when it comes to the environment is what we call the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons is the idea that no state is responsible for things held in common. Okay, so these are considered collective goods. And so collective goods are things that benefit all concerned, whether or not they participate in the production or the maintenance and they're not owned by when any one state actor. So the two classic example of collective goods are, I've already mentioned them both in this lecture, air and water, right? Air and water. 
because as much as we would like to try, we can't put all of the air in a box and keep it and sell it, you know, to people. The air just is the air. We all benefit from the air. We all use the air. We all damage the air. And because no one owns the air, the challenge of the tragedy of the commons is, well, who is going to clean the air? Who is going to make it better? Who is willing to stop doing what they're doing if you're making money doing it? Who's willing to stop doing what they're doing for the expense of cleaning the air? Okay, same thing applies with water. So there are four key challenges that have emerged because of the tragedy of the commons when we're thinking about the environment. So the key challenges, the first one is, I've already mentioned it, pollution. So things like air pollution, water pollution, pollution in the form of our debris, our trash, filling rivers, filling lakes, filling landfills, filling the ocean, and creating a real crisis, not only for wildlife that lives in these areas, but for us, poisoning ourselves through not caring for our own trash, through overconsuming and overuse of plastics, etc. So our world and data, you remember that from our data day, our world and data has a lot of great material on uh, pollution. If this is something that interests you, I encourage you to go back to the site and look through a lot of the statistics that they have on pollution, not only air, they do a great thing where they break down indoor versus outdoor air pollution, sources of pollution, etc. So there's a lot of good infographics there if that's something that interests you. The second one we could talk about then is deforestation. So deforestation, no more forests, okay? Cutting down the forests. And it's important of cutting it down faster than its rate of reproduction. So a lot of people will try and be strategic. So it may be that you will do, you'll do limited cutting and you'll do planting. But it can take trees a long time to grow to a point where they are ready to be harvested again. You know, you're talking about cutting down, you can cut down half a forest in a month, but it can take 15 years before the trees are strong enough for you to go in and say, all right, we'll cut again, okay? Um, so deforestation is a really, really big challenge all around the world. And deforestation comes with its own issues. I lived this in Malawi. I saw this every day. I worked with people. It was just, oh, it was devastating to see the effects of deforestation because if one of the things that the trees do, it's not just the trees and the wood that you get above, it's the roots below. The roots below are so essential for holding soil constant, keeping it in the same place, providing nutrients that it needs. So if you're removing the trees, you get all types of issues like erosion. You don't have the soil being as healthy, which means you don't end up having as strong crop yields. Okay, so removing the trees does so much more than just take away habitat for animals that would live in those trees. You're destroying everything that is around the trees as well. Entire ecosystems not even attached to the trees. You can be destroying the prairie land to the left of the trees, right? Another one then very much linked to deforestation, desertification, desertification, okay? Desertification, desertif desertification makes it sound like, ooh, desert. No, desertification, this is where a big challenge would be things like overgrazing. So the picture of the slide, you can see there kind of um, a, a very sparsely grassed hill with lots of cattle on it. So putting too many animals in one place, they destroy that environment. It doesn't give it, you are not giving it time to recover. You can create a desert where there was once an oasis. If you use the materials too much, too fast, and you don't give it time to recover. Another really big challenge with this that humans are causing more than humans through their animals or something is taking water out of the water table. Okay, so we are consuming way more water than we need, using way more water in our industries, in our farming, right? So if you can think of some of the different cash crops that are very important in the world, the biggest, you know, a big one being cotton. Cotton is a very water intensive um, crop. It needs lots of water. Sugar, sugar needs lots and lots of water. So you have to have lots of irrigation, so in countries like Syria or Egypt, or even again, in my example of Malawi, you are having to do lots of artificial irrigation 
where you're pulling water up from the water table, that is devastating. The water table needs that water. The land needs that water. So if you take it all up, you can take it all. You can take all the water, empty the table, and create a desert above where the water was. And that is happening. That is happening all around the world. Um, and it's, it's a big issue. The fourth one that we can think about in terms of key challenges with the tragedy of the commons is climate change itself. The fact that uh, not just climate change, but you know, because the climate is always changing, but human caused climate change that is causing the earth to heat at a much more rapid pace than it was going to were we not being involved in it. Okay. So we'll come back to climate change uh, in a couple of slides here, but if we think about, okay, so the same thing with human rights, we set out human rights and then we asked, okay, well, what are people doing about it? Same thing we can do here with international law. That's the next slide. There is a whole universe now of environmental law. You can go and be an environmental lawyer and deal with these issues uh, in real time. Okay. So a lot of the goals with environmental law are to promote things like cooperation between states, control, control of resources and how quickly they can be used or destroyed, reforming current practices to make them more sustainable, and really focusing on future planning. The idea of we have to be thinking about not just what I want now for my bottom line, but what does my company want 15 years from now for a bottom line? If we take all the fish now, what are we gonna do as fishermen in 15 years, okay? Other impacts and improvements that we've seen with environmental law are things like norm creation. Uh, an example I gave in a previous lecture with another class was something like um, the tuna industry really um, pushing the idea of uh, saving dolphins. Okay, so you see on like any can of tuna you buy, there's like the little logo that says dolphin safe. Okay, so save the whales, save the dolphins, this idea of overfishing and corrupt, um, damaging fishing practices were leading to a lot of dolphins being caught in nets that were meant to be catching tuna because dolphins eat tuna too. So dolphins are often following tuna. So if you have a big trolling net, you're gonna catch a dolphin in that net with tuna because they're trying to eat the tuna, okay? So norm creation of like, we should not do that. Dolphins are precious, dolphins are mammals, dolphins are really smart. You think of all these values that we attach to dolphins and that we have to fundamentally change the way that we fish so as to protect creatures like dolphins, okay? They also, very similar to the last lecture we did with NGOs and their capacity building uh, for human rights, things like, uh, providing aid, providing scientific understanding. You need people, NGOs, um, individuals, universities. Universities can be big for that too. Promoting scientific understanding and helping us understand what do the models look like? How much time do we have? How bad could this get if we don't address this? Okay. So We'll end this lecture with a couple, just a couple of more slides here about uh, climate change in particular, because this can be a really sticky issue. Um, it is very highly politicized, not only in this country, but a lot of countries around the world, this is highly politicized. So I've got two videos, I've linked them down below. You can see them on the module page as well. I'd love for you to watch them. And so the first one is addressing this question of how much consensus is there across the sciences that human-caused climate change is a legitimate threat. The other video then, video three, is a funny one. Okay, so this is, I don't know if any of you watched last week tonight with John Oliver, but this was just kind of a humorous take that he took. These two videos go together really well. So watch number two first, and then watch number three for some comic relief, and he's addressing more of the points that are made in the second video. And there's a special guest star that John Oliver brings out. It's pretty funny, the, the shtick that he does. Um, it's worth watching. So I'll stop there. We will come back together in just a minute. Watch those videos. We'll only have a couple minutes left of this lecture, but to bring us into our break, I figured since we've been talking about whales and tunas and dolphins, I'll bring up a little ocean friend here to share with you a song that has ruined my life. We'll be right back together.
Okay, so hopefully you watched those two videos. I love that John Oliver one. I love it. I love when he does the quiz of, you may as well ask, do owls exist? Are there hats, right? I just, I love the way he does, <laughs> does that shtick. It's really funny. Um, but anyway, if we're thinking climate change and IR then, this particular issue of climate change. So the international scientific consensus on this issue has been settled since the 1980s, okay? That this is real this is a threat and it should be being addressed all right so the threats that we're facing um, the book gives a great breakdown figure 12.2 i'll toss that up now in kind of a split screen for you figure 12.2 it shows not only surface temperatures sea levels greenhouse gases anthropogenic co2 emissions not only from forestry and other land use but fossil fuels anthropogenic meaning it's us okay human caused co2 emissions not natural to the environment we are causing them over time so some of the challenges that we're going to be facing are not only the fact that we're having this crisis of the world is getting hotter uh, growing times are getting shorter sea levels rising but the challenge we need to be thinking about from the ir perspective is who's going to feel this first who is going to feel the effects of climate change first and in what ways? And how should we be addressing those challenges to human security? Because this climate security issue is absolutely a human security issue as well. So the challenge becomes who's going to feel it first? Who has the incentive to stop doing what they're doing first to attempt to be combating these challenges that we're facing? The UN has really been leading this charge for a long time. The UN understands that the consensus is settled, that this is real, and that this is a threat to global, economic, international, and human security. So in 1992, you had the UN establishing the framework for the, oh my gosh, it's the FCC, FCCC, Framework Convention on Climate Change, 1992. By 97, you had the Kyoto Protocol signed where most countries in the world were coming together to engage in things like capping carbon emissions, lowering carbon emissions, engaging in sustainable development practices. 2015, you had the Paris Agreement. This was meant to be a, a revision and a renewal and a refocusing of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and just something like from the previous lectures we've talked about, the UN Sustainable Development Goals in and of themselves having such an emphasis on protecting and promoting the climate, protecting and promoting sustainable development, okay? So from not only the NGO perspective, but this IO perspective, lots of movement is being done to address climate change. The challenge then comes, compared to the previous lecture we did on human rights, the challenge becomes the state initiatives, state-based initiatives to protect and promote the climate, okay? This has been a little bit more interesting to see, particularly from the perspective of us being here, being U.S. citizens, because the U.S. has been really waffling, right? Lots of back and forth, lots of two steps forward, seven steps back on uh, politicizing climate change, making decisions about climate, um, protections for the climate and then rolling them back. We did it with the Kyoto Protocol. We've just did it recently with the Paris Agreement. Why do we keep doing this? Why does the US in particular as one of the strongest economies, as one of the most important world players, as one of the people that has the most knowledge creation being done on this subject? Scholars across US universities are publishing on this all, all, all the time. We are part of the consensus. We are building the consensus saying this is real. And yet when you hear our politics, especially if you watch that John Oliver lecture, there is very much a politicized slant to this that says it's not settled. There is not consensus. There is this like 50-50 camp, right? And that is not true. It's just not true when it comes to the science. The UN believes the science and agrees that it's not true. What is it? What is it about us that we are continuing to pursue this very politicized slant to climate change? So I'd love your thoughts here. And that'll just be a last, a last thought to round out the semester. If you want to share, that would be great. Share down below. 
why do we do this? Why does the U.S. in particular not get on board fully with this or get on board but then hop off whenever we want to? Okay, that's where we'll end this lecture for today. Um, and uh, essentially, this, that's where we'll end for the semester. So I want to, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll meet again. We'll meet in the Zoom and then, I mean, you guys have my email. Hopefully you guys can make the Zoom. If you don't make the Zoom, I'll just end this by saying thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being a great class. When we were in class together, you guys were awesome. We always had good dialogue, good discussion. I really appreciated the examples that you would give and the attention that you gave to me. It can be tough, right? A lunchtime class can be tough. Um, and you guys have been superstars doing this transition as well. You guys have been on time with your work. You've let me know if there's reasons why you couldn't be. Um, so just thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interest in this subject. It may not have been of great interest to you. Maybe you took this not knowing what it would be. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've learned something about international relations. I hope you're more curious about current events. And I hope you're more critical. I hope you are more critical about news when you're reading it and that you're putting on these different lenses and you're thinking it through from multiple perspectives so that we're understanding more about issues when we're reading them in the news in particular, okay? Um, I'd love to keep in touch. Uh, if you have any questions moving forward about anything, whether it's the department, study abroad, scholarships, what to do with this, grad school, whatever, you know, whatever, you're, whatever you're feeling out there, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to stay in touch with you and uh, just have a great day. All right. Have a great day. Have a great summer. And we'll have uh, we'll have Baby Shark uh, play us out. See you guys. <laughs>